I do have one more announcement that's very special. Coming up on December 16th, we have another wedding. I think uh, love is in the air here in Miami. Uh, we'll be having Hugh and Stephanie getting married on December 16th. Let me ask you a question. What is the biggest, most desperate problem on the planet today? Selfishness, what else? Sin, what else? Dirty what, pollution? What else? What's that? Fear? Inequality. Inequality? So if things were equal, everything would be better? What about politics? What about poverty? People. People? <laughs> Biggest problem on planet Earth is people, someone said. I'm just quoting them. I didn't say Climate change? Yeah. COVID? Yeah. Biggest problem on planet Earth today was dealt with by Jesus when he showed up. Wow. That's before there were the giant conglomerate corporations that some of you have so faithfully tried to protest or come against. It's before they had hundreds of billions of pounds of garbage in the seas, which people are trying to deal with. It's one of my new passions of things I want to do outside of what we do at the church is just to help with things like that. But at the end of the day, what is the biggest issue, the most desperate, pressing issue known to man today? Look in Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. These uh, awesome brothers are going to help me, and it's going to be hilarious, but we'll see what happens. Mark chapter 2. What did Jesus fix? In verse 1, it says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. You know, when you go home, the Bible says that a prophet is not honored in his own home. So Jesus is back home, if you will. And people are doubting him. People question him. People try to discredit him, as they did everywhere. But at home, it just seems a little more, you know. Your mom comes up and says, oh, clean the toilet, you know. and Take care of this and go pick up after the cat. You know, and you're like, what? Mom, I'm like 55 years old. Um, but he, he got home. But Jesus was not intimidated by the people in his home. People did not make Jesus cower in fear and change his persona so that he could be something for them. Jesus was Jesus wherever he went. Never gave in to insecurity. Never gave in to pride. Never got distracted from the very reason that he came. But here he comes home. And when he comes home, verse has so many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door. Yeah. You know, there's still room left in here at the BBC. Yeah. Although we're about half full these days. Now, the whole congregation is here, but look back here. Everyone look back in the back. See, we've got more room back here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we're not quite yet imitating Jesus, Metro Miami Church. Wow. Can I get an amen? amen. But could we? See, I believe that if we got as focused as Jesus was, this room would be absolutely too small. There would be people in the hallway. We'd open these doors because you can't see through them. And they'd be hanging out with us. It'd be awesome. We'd open the back door. We'll figure it out, and then we'll go find another place. But Metro Miami Church, I don't think we yet quite understand the heart of Jesus and just how focused he was. He came not to fix filthy oceans. He came not to fix corporate greed. He came not to fix politics. He came to fix you and me. We were broken. 
Something happened. It separated us from God. And, and God sent his son down. And he came here to do something radical. To turn the world upside down. And it had nothing to do with politics. Had nothing to do with race. Had nothing to do with any of that garbage. Let's see what he did. So the people are gathered. There's no room left. Not even outside the door. And he preached the word to them. This is what Jesus did. Jesus showed up and he could have gone, everyone's healed. Jesus showed up and he goes, no pollution. Jesus could have showed up and said, no more greed. But he did. He preached. That's what Jesus did. You're like, what's well, so stupid? That's so stupid. Now, if I was Jesus, I would, oh yeah. <laughs> okay. Amen. This is what he did. He preached the word to them. The problem is, in churches around the world, words are being preached, but the word isn't being preached. Things are being said, but it's good psychology, but not necessarily good theology. And then even where the word is preached, quite often the people hear it, it hits their heart and boing, it just bounces right now. Goes in one ear, doesn't find anything in there, it comes right out the other. Whoosh, whoosh. It's like a wind tunnel. We hear it and we go, ooh, that's convicting. Gosh, I hope Marcel changes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thinking about your wife, yeah, if she was listening, man, let me tell you. Thinking about your husband, if you knew my husband. <laughs> Jesus could have done anything he wanted. And he goes, I'm going to preach. I'm going to preach the word. I'm going to preach the word of God. Because it will absolutely change the world. Some men came bringing him a paralytic carried by four of them. Since they could not get to him, uh, excuse me, since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus, and after digging through it, lowered the mat the paralyzed man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, did you, did you know that you could see faith? Oh, look, there's some right there. <laughs> oh, there's another one. You can't touch it, can you? You, you? you can't hear it. Oh, that's faith. Or is this faith? I don't know. But Jesus goes, you know, I can see their faith. Well, how did he see their faith? There's a crowd. That's so big that people are standing outside trying to get in. And these four guys have a friend of theirs who's a paralytic. He can't move. And they go, you know, in these days, they didn't have special wheelchairs and special help. You were just laying on a mat and begging and hoping someone would give you some money. So they go, you know, this is our chance. We've heard Jesus preach. This guy is pretty awesome. I saw, him, I, I saw him heal someone. We were over in the other town. Hey, guys, let's get together. Let's go help our friend. We've got to do something. We've got to do something. So they get him on over there. They see the crowd. They can't get in. So they come up with this harebrained, crazy idea. Hey, one of the guys goes, let's go on the roof. Now, I want you to stop and think about this for a second. How tall is your house? Let's say to get on your roof, 10, 12 feet, right? Maybe 15. And then you got to get the guy up there. The title of the lesson today is Five Guys on a Rope. With a rope and a mat. They go, okay. Uh, we got to get through the crowd. Excuse me, pardon me, excuse me, pardon me, excuse me. And they get up to the next to the house. And they're like, well, what do we do now? They must have found a ladder. I don't know. I've been trying to reason through that. How do they do this? 
So they, they got some kind of ladder or some kind of stool or something, and then, you know, they got one guy up there, and they look at the rope, and they go, well, I don't know, what do we do with this? And then they got it around the, the mat, and they, they kind of picked him up, and his head hit, oh, sorry, okay, let's see, uh, try this, uh, we'll try that, and then he falls out of the mat, like, oh, okay, what are we doing? <laughs> Jesus is in there, he's still preaching, you know, and, and everyone's going, what are these knuckleheads doing? And yet they're so passionate that their friend could meet Jesus that they get him on the roof. I mean, can you imagine just dripping sweat? But they're high five, like, yeah, we got him up here. Come on. Now what do we do? What do we do? So they look to the roof and they go, you know, there's probably mud and straw with some wood in between that they had to dig through. So they go, oh, we have an idea. One of the other guys goes, I have an idea. Let's, let's dig through the roof. He goes, bro, did you bring a shovel? Uh, no. Well, let's go. And they, they put the paralyzed guy down, and they start digging in this dirt. Start digging through the roof. And Jesus is preaching the word. He's in there. The crowd's listening. They, all of a sudden, this little piece of dirt goes, boink, right off Jesus' head. And the people start moving back. What, what's going on? Is the roof caving in? And all of a sudden you see a little gleam of light and it's like, oh, what in the world? What are these guys doing? And then some hands come through and more dirt gets out of the way. They move some of the boards out of the way. And all of a sudden you see a big hole in the roof. And you're like, what are these crazy guys doing? And then they, they scooch the, the paralyzed guy over to the hole. And he's going, I trust you guys. I really do. And they prayed, dear God, help us to get him down there and not kill him. <laughs> so they start lowering him in. They realize the hole's too small. Yeah, so they dig out some more. And everyone just stopped. Jesus just stopped. And he's just watching this whole thing going, this is interesting. I see something here. I see something here. They start lowering him down. You can hear the grunts. <clears throat> oh, what is oh, bro, I'm not, not too far, bro. Okay. Paralyzed guys, like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and then they get him right in front of Jesus. And the Bible says Jesus saw their faith. Faith is not a feeling. Faith is not a thought. Faith is not a superfluous, airy, fairy idea like, oh, I have faith. No, you don't. Faith can be seen by what you do. These guys had the faith to get this man on the roof, down in the hole, in front of Jesus. Yeah. I always wonder, how did they know where Jesus was in the room? I don't know. They dug a hole right in the right place. But they had faith. They went for it. Why did they do this? Because they knew this man had a problem. Yeah. And they knew Jesus was the solution. If I can just get him in the hole, down there in front of Jesus, that guy's going to do something. I don't know what he's going to do, but he's going to do something. So the, the guy's down there, and the guy's up on the roof like, <laughs> they're holding him, and he's like kind of swinging in front of Jesus. <laughs> and Jesus like, yeah, just, just put him down. Just put him down. <laughs> just lay him all the way down. And he's laying there on the floor, and he is paralyzed. And he can't move. And then it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, let's clean the oceans. He said to the paralytic, let's stop corporate greed. Then he said to the paralytic, you know, this thing called COVID is going to show up in 2020 and we're going to heal it now so it doesn't affect anybody else. It is a legit problem, like all those other things. Let's, let's stop poverty. And you're looking at the, the paralyzed guy. Yeah, let's stop poverty. And he's like, okay. <laughs> I am paralyzed. <laughs> but Jesus goes, son, your sins are forgiven. Yeah. What? Do you understand? The four guys on the roof are like, wait, what? <laughs> I mean, we just dug through a roof? And he says, your sins are forgiven? Can you imagine how they must have felt? Like, what? I, I, that's good, but Jesus, look, look at the guy. Jesus, did, were you paying attention? 
the paralyzed guy's going, yeah. <laughs> like, were you paying attention? But Jesus saw the biggest problem, the most desperate, horrific thing in mankind. And he dealt with it like that. He goes, son, your sins are forgiven. I see their faith. These guys loved you. These guys cared for you. These guys sweat for you. I bet there's calluses and maybe blood on their hands because they got you here in front of me. So the most important thing I could do for you is forgive your sins. Yeah. These guys back here represent the five guys on a rope. They're going to attempt something right now. I just want you to get a visual of what it takes to have a paralyzed guy on a rope. Uh, let's give it up for Albertini. You know. In a couple of seconds, he will be the paralyzed guy. And then you've got Damien and David and Zach and, and, and Juan, and, and, and they're, they're the four friends. I mean, they, they, they love Albertini. And so let's, uh, let's see what we can do here. You know, you would say break a leg, but that wouldn't be good. They, they made up this whole rope thing themselves. They just, I said, guys, figure it out. You guys think Albertini's nervous? Imagine what they had to think of and go through in order to come up with this. And we're only going to lower him, Lord willing, about two and a half feet. Worked a lot better earlier. They even practiced. Yeah. Oh. We got Albertini down two and a half feet. That took a little while. We didn't have to dig through a roof. We didn't have to climb up on the roof. Uh, do you guys love Albertini? Yep. Do you guys think he lo they love Albertini? Yeah. You know, and what would be your priority laying there, bro? <laughs> Forgiveness? See, the problem is we get so focused so focused on things that at the end of the day won't matter in eternity. We get enamored, like totally enamored and seduced by these things that are, yes, they're important. But what is the single most important thing that you could have? Forgiveness. In the scriptures, in the Old Testament, and the New Testament, the entire focus of Christianity comes down to one topic, and that is forgiveness. Yeah. There's forgiveness for the sinner, someone who's never met the Lord, someone who doesn't know him, or maybe they've had religious experiences, but they did not understand from the scriptures what it meant to be saved. They need forgiveness, and then there's forgiveness for the saint, the one who's been baptized as a disciple, all their sins are forgiven. 
They've been given the Holy Spirit. They're going through life, and then they lust. Or they lie, which is horrible. Or, or they, they just get lazy. There's forgiveness for that person, too. Wow. Yeah. All of Christianity can really be focused in on this one singular issue. And so when the paralytic was laid in front of Jesus, he didn't go, oh, let me heal you. Because at the end of the day, let me just be blunt with you, he didn't care. You're like, Matt. Then why did he forgive his sins first? Because it just wasn't important to Jesus. If this guy would have died forgiven and still paralyzed, praise God. If he would have died no longer paralyzed but not forgiven, what happens? Let me, let me just hear some, some, some uh, response. What happens to a person at the time they die if they're not forgiven of their sins? Help me out. You guys are mean. God wouldn't do that. You guys are mean. God loves everybody. Like somebody actually said he'd go to hell. Oh, come on. Someone said the opposite. He won't go to heaven. That's easier to say, isn't it? Yeah. He won't go to heaven. What do you mean? He won't go to heaven. So what do you mean? He's not going to be in heaven? So where is he going to be? Not in heaven? <laughs> we wrestle with this because we forget that God is just. He is righteous. He is absolutely pure. In him there is no darkness at all. He is light. He is love. Yeah. He's the king of kings and the lord of lords. You don't show up with a bunch of sin. That's right. If you show up with a bunch of sin, either you have to be forgiven or you will be exiled. Yeah. Yeah. Period. The Bible says in Isaiah 59 that sin separates us from God. His biggest problem is not that he's paralyzed. It's those dreads. Oh, no, sorry, sorry. No, sorry, sorry that, that's a different sermon. That's, <laughs> you know, I'm going to be honest. If I could dr grow dreads, I probably would. It'd be kind of cool. But I can't, so. And my wife wouldn't appreciate that. <laughs> Albertina, I love your dreads. It's okay. <laughs> Jesus goes, I'm going to deal with the single most important thing because what if the guy dies 10 seconds after they start trying to lift him back up again? He was laser focused. Metro Miami Church, is that your heart? Or when you meet people, you go, how can I do business with you? How can I feel good about myself because I met you? But see, how can I manipulate you? Wow. How can I get something from you? Because I'm so needy. <laughs> Sucking the life out of people. I, I, I can say that because I used to do that all the time. My needs weren't being met in my relationship with God because I didn't know how. And so I just sucked the life out of people to try to get something. And the more I sucked, the more empty I was. What he needs are four friends who love him enough to get him in front of Jesus. Point number one, you are the paralytic. You are the paralytic. I read a story this morning of a guy who born and raised, was born and raised in Germany. He really wanted to be successful, so he got himself a really good education. He was very talented and became a very important and influential artist. Decided to move to Dominican Republic to seek his fortune. He went down there, poured himself out. 
His business cranked. Everyone knew him. He was making a lot of money. He was making a fortune. And he goes, man, I, I need a wife. So he found a wife. Man. Awesome Dominican wife. Yeah. Some Dominicans in the house, huh? Amen. <laughs> He loves his life, he loves his wife, his business is booming, things are cranking. Seven years later, his wife dies. He no longer cared about his business. He let everything fall apart. He no longer cared about his art, he stopped painting. Decided to move to New York and maybe get a fresh start. Moves to New York, he's there for a couple of years, he falls into a deep depression because he lost his wife. He decides one day to fill all of his pockets with rocks. And he jumps off a bridge. And he drowns in the North River. Because he was focused on the wrong things. Wow. Wow. When they found him, they were like, wow, he's like an anchor. Because his pockets were filled with rocks. And in the story, the writer says, you know, the guy didn't have his own anchor, so he made one. And he died, empty and lost because someone was far more important to him than God. At the end of the day, nobody gets out of this thing alive. Are you with me? Yeah. We're all gonna die. The single most important thing for you and 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 me is a relationship with God where I can have forgiveness. Amen. Amen. I appreciate the story because the four guys that love their friend, Albertini, they, they got him in front of Jesus. They were willing to do whatever it took. They got him in front of Jesus. And they got to see... Jesus go, your sins are forgiven, son. And I think maybe at first they're like, what? We did all that for that? And then it starts to hit them as Jesus responds. Now some of the teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. I mean, who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And they said to him, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? What's easier? No, no, no. What's easier to say? Your sins are forgiven. Mm, kiss the ring. I mean, anybody that can form words can say, oh, your sins are forgiven. Your sins are forgiven? Anybody can say that. But how do you know the sins are forgiven? How do you know? Nothing happened. He's still paralyzed. He's still laying there. Get up, dude. Do you, do you understand? How do you know? I read this thing since I was 19 years old. When I was a kid, by the time I was 19, I had read and memorized 50 scriptures. But I didn't understand what it meant to have a relationship with God. And I did not understand how to be forgiven. I was talking or trying to talk to God. I was trying to read the Bible. That year I went to LSU for a year. I read the entire Bible in one semester because I'm trying to figure out what's in here. What does it mean? What's this for? What does God want for me? What's going on with my life? I've ruined every relationship I have. I had nothing. I knew I needed something. Because God put inside the heart of every single one of us a deep desire to be close to him. Yeah. And then when you find that block and you can't figure out how to be close to him, if you will keep seeking for the truth, Amen. the Bible promises that you will find it. Amen. And that longing inside wasn't for the paralytic to be healed. The longing inside was for him to have a restored relationship with God and all of his sins forgiven. Amen. I'll never forget, August 28th, 1988. Took me three and a half years to study the Bible. <laughs> Some people it takes three days. I took a little longer. 
I was baptized. Why was I baptized? Jesus commands it. The apostles command it. The Bible expects it. And in baptism, and I want you guys, if you don't believe that or understand that, go back to your Bible, find someone that brought you today, and get into it and figure out what it really means. In this act of faith, it's not a work. People talk about that, being a work to save yourself. You can't save yourself. You have to have an act of faith, and faith can be seen. So in an act of faith, you repent of your sins, you become a disciple, a follower of Jesus, and then you're baptized. Just study out Acts chapter 2. It's where the kingdom starts. All your sins are forgiven, and he'll indwell in you with the Holy Spirit. That promise is for you and every single person on planet Earth who will hear the word that Jesus preached. These guys get up on the roof, they made it happen, and their friend got forgiven. Let's finish the story. What's easier to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or say, get up, take your mat, and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He says, let me just show you. I'm going to prove to you the guy's sins are forgiven. I tell you, said to the paralytic, get up, take your mat, and go home. Now, you guys all get that I'm not really Jesus, right? <laughs> and that Albertini wasn't paralyzed. <laughs> so, to make sure you knew that, Aaron, <laughs> you're thinking, what happens here in the Miami church? Amen. They're from Orlando, you know. So. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we've never seen anything like this. Wow. You know, when you come to church, that's what I hope you can walk away saying. Amen. As you meet the different members, and I, I know most of them, you know, a lot of you guys I still don't even know. I see you with a mask on week after week, and I'm like, are you Bill or are you Sam? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and all of you get to see me. It's not fair. You all know my name, and I go, hey, bro. <laughs> I feel terrible. <laughs> And so I'm trying my best to get past that and, and I get to know everybody, but man, what a, what a miracle that we can come in here and Isaac, although he's Cuban, Cuban-American, and he grew up in Hialeah. <laughs> We're best friends. Ted Green. He's more my color. But that's not why we're, we're best friends. Because he loves the Lord. And he loves me. And I, I'm the paralytic. And I need friends like that. And there's OJ. I'm taller than him. I have more hair. <laughs> One of my best friends in the world. I could go on. There, there's so many more. I, you know, I think about my friendship with Marcel. You're killing me. December 5th, we're sending him off to Atlanta. And although I believe in that, I think it's the right thing. And I think Atlanta is going to get a dose of healthy spiritual help. Amen. It does break my heart when best friends leave. We'll be friends for life. I do believe that. 
but that's tough. But I, I'm the paralytic. I need friends like that. Then we actually have a Dominican who leads a region. Well. Professor Will Pena. <laughs> And um, Will and I grew up different, but the guy loves me. You know, I, I, I appreciate it. Sometimes Will will send me this long text. Hey, bro, you think you could have done that a little better? Maybe try this or that. And I'm like, <laughs> he's, he's right. <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> the guys that God put in my life, they're not, um, they're not yes men. They tell me the truth, they speak the truth in love, and I need that. Yeah. I'm the paralytic. I need friends around me that tell me the truth, that love me, that'll take care of me, that'll lower me on a mat through a roof so that I could be healed and spend time with yeah. Jesus. Come on, I talked to the brothers on Wednesday night about this, and I just want to share it with you. Yeah. If you would take the four corners of the rope that they used to lay him down. I think you can find four things that you need if you understand that you're the paralytic. Yeah. You need help in four areas. Right. You need someone that's going to share this kind of heart with you. You have desperate needs. The fir first rope, and I think the most important rope that you need, is the rope of quiet times. You need times with God where you can connect with him every single day. I challenged the brothers pretty hard on Wednesday night, and uh, there were some uncomfortable feelings. There were some brothers who wanted to talk to me afterwards. There was a couple that were mad, but didn't tell me. They told someone else, hey, man, I still love you, but stop being a wimp. Who, who am I? If I offended you on Wednesday night, I am sorry. I'm very sorry. But I don't think I should have offended you. Yes, I was being hard line, because that's what I prayed about, and that's what I preached. But if you got your feelings hurt Wednesday night, or you got mad at me Wednesday night, you didn't say anything, you're in sin, and you need to repent. And I expect you to be a man of God and repent. Come say something to me. I'm not going to hit you. I've got a lot of fake teeth, but I'm not going to bite you. But I just want to tell you, we've got a problem. We've got a problem. Here's what's amazing. You have to love me. You have to love me. Yeah, but bro, you, you, you hurt my feelings. You still have to love me. You know what the coolest things about the church is you have to love me. I didn't make that up. The Bible did. It commands you to love me. So do you know what I expect? Love. I'm the paralytic. I need it. If I offend you, and it's quite possible that I will, if I let you down, and it's highly likely that I will, if I sin against you, and probably I already did, then you have to love me. Woo! Go me! I didn't come up with that. The Lord did. Yeah. But if you said something to someone else and you didn't say it to me, you're gossiping and you're slandering and you are far from God. You need to repent. Yeah. I tell you that because I love you. You didn't say anything because you don't love me. And it wasn't just one person. It was multiple. Now, I did have one brother, and I shall not mention his name, but he did chase me down in the parking lot. Name starts with a W. And he came and told me exactly what he felt. And I go, bro, thank you for saying something. But you're wrong. And we had a good time. It was really good. I mean, I wasn't being prideful or something. I wanted to hear what he had to say. But I felt that his understanding of what I was doing was a little bit off. But I appreciated the fact that he said, came and said something. I feel closer to him. That, that's what a man of God does. And I need all the brothers. If you were offended on Wednesday night, I need you to repent and say something to me. On, but if the things that I preach from the scriptures 
were true, you need to repent of those things as well. That, that's Bible. It's not my idea. It's Bible. This first rope is a quiet time that represents a desperate need that all of us have, and that is to be close to God. In a time that you set aside to be close to God, you want to take time every morning to read your Bible, to get into it, to open it up, to put your phone away. I challenge the brothers, put your phone away. Just put it somewhere else. And, and get into the Word and let God speak to you. He had this written so that He could talk to us. He wants to connect with you. And here's what's funny. He doesn't need you. You need Him. Get into the Word. Dig in there and try to figure out what God is saying to you. Get your new start for the day. Get your heart jump started so you can move on. And then take time to pray. Where you just talk to God. Get alone. I try to pray before it gets daylight. Because I don't want someone to see me thinking, that guy's out of his mind walking down the beach. Rah, 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 you know? <laughs> Amen. If that's what you do, that's fine. But I, I want to be alone with God. I want to be away. Quite often I'll pray with my wife at different times, but I, I love my time with God. I need that. I desperately need that. I'm the paralytic. That's the first rope. The second rope is the rope of discipleship. Where, where without that, you might get down in front of Jesus, but you're probably going to fall on your head. Because wow. you're trying to figure out Christianity all by yourself. Wow. No one in the Bible became a Christian by themselves. Amen. It always took someone else. Yeah. And amazingly, Jesus says, go and make disciples, baptize them, right, of all nations, and then teaching them to obey everything I commanded you. So for the rest of my life, I've been a Christian for 33 years, I still get discipling. I still have someone in my life helping me. There's a disciple who's a student and a pupil and a student of Jesus Christ himself, right? Yeah. And a student is a learner, but a, a learner needs a teacher. Yeah. You want to learn how to be a disciple and you want to learn how to grow more quickly, get into the life of someone. Yeah. Yeah. After um, staff uh, on Tuesday... Was it Tuesday? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> what day is it? Sunday? <laughs> I don't know. What day is it. I think I'm still jet lagged. Seems like it was yesterday. I can't remember. Um, Damien pulled me aside. Yeah. And he says, hey, bro, can you just talk for a few minutes? I said, I don't have time. He goes, okay, can I talk for a few minutes? <laughs> <laughs> All right. And he just proceeded to ask me about 25 questions. And I didn't have time. But it was awesome. Uh, it was yesterday, wasn't it? Yeah. I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> I'm the paralytic, amen? But Damien just wanted, he already gets disciple from someone else, but he, he wanted me to help him. The word disciple, you turn it into a gerund, and it's discipling, right? It's an action word. It's not just a disciple's a thing. Discipling happens in a relationship where you have someone sit down with you, share the scriptures, and talk to you and help you with your heart. I think in our church, we need to have this rope it needs to get a lot bigger and you need to hold on to it a lot more where you really get discipling. Come on, bro. Yeah. You know, I did challenge the brothers on Wednesday night and this is what some of them got mad about. We were trying to figure out where to play ultimate Frisbee and finally we found a field across the way and I said, guys, follow me and I took off running. And about 20 guys ran right with me, and we got there, and I looked back, and there was like 80 guys just kind of walking. And I'm like, well, they did follow me, but did they follow me? And I said to one of the guys who got offended, I said, listen, if the guy who disciples me, Kip, said, hey, follow me, and took off across the field running, I'd have took off across the field running with him. So I questioned him. I said, why didn't you guys run? And they're like, well. You know why they're offended? Because they didn't want to. They wanted to do what they wanted to do. And even me talking about this, I know this makes some of you feel uncomfortable. Because you don't like discipling. You don't like following. Like, no, 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 I like it. I just, I didn't like that. I was discipling you. I was trying to help you understand. 
Guys, if Kip would have run across the field, I'd have been right there with him. Come on, let's go. Woo, Kip 67. <laughs> He'd probably still outrun me. <laughs> and and I'd, have, I'd have been asking him questions along the way. Hey, bro, I've got this issue on my Bible tech. Hey, can you help me with it? Hey, bro, I've been wrestling with this sin. Can, can you help me with it? Hey, bro, what do you think about this idea? Can you help me with it? And we would have had a good talk, run across the field. It would have been awesome. But I think some of you don't understand the, the desperation you have in this rope that's going to save your life of discipling. Yeah. You don't understand it. So I can't be mad at you. I wasn't angry Wednesday night. I was indignant. I wasn't angry. But you're not holding on to this rope that can save your life. Yeah. And I think it's killing some of you. You don't have 100 people fall away in a year if they're getting discipling. Some of you who are discipling people, you don't understand it, and so you're not helping. You don't love them enough to tell them the truth. You don't love them enough to pull them out when they're in danger. You don't love them enough to help them have faith. You don't love them enough to challenge them when they don't run across the field with you. I do. And although I might have made you feel uncomfortable, number one, please talk to me. Number two, you've got to learn something. Discipling is a lifeline. It's a rope that will save your life. Amen. And then what's so powerful about it is then you can duplicate that with other people and it saves their lives. It changes them so they can be different people. The third rope is evangelism. Some people take evangelism and they take that rope and they hang themselves with it. Wow. Evangelism! And some leaders take that rope and they strangle their people. Evangelize more. <laughs> okay, bro. It's not really what it's for. Wow. Yes, wow. <laughs> this is the evangel. Amen. The word. The message. The good news. Yeah. When Jesus showed up, he preached. Yeah. The word. The word. Are you with me? Yeah. This is the evangel. This thing right here is the word of God. And the Bible says that it's living and active. So it's not just a thing, it's something that we put into practice. It's something that's alive. God speaks to us and it changes us to different people. And if you don't share it with someone else, you stop the cycle of the evangel. The evangel is supposed to be heard, listened to, obeyed, put into practice, and then share with another person until they also hear it, obey it, put it into practice, and then they share with another person, and then you have the evangel. Yeah. The whole thing is completed, and then you stop, right? No. The evangel is evangelism. It's what happens over and over and over, and it's the reason there are over 200 people in this room this morning. Because oh, yeah. someone goes, you know what? My knees are knocking. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Hi, I'm, I'm, what's my name? Matt, and uh, I want to, I, could you, maybe there's this ch or church uh, Bible study thing. I don't know. What are you doing tomorrow? <laughs> you feel stupid. You feel weird. You don't know what to say. So what? Share your faith. Amen. Start talking to people. And you're going to find the evangel is super fun. It's kind of like when those guys got the guy in front of Jesus. They're sweating. They're grunting. And they get him down there, look at each other like, that was awesome, bro. We got him down there. And he, oh, dude, he's forgiven. That is awesome. They're high-fiving. They're jumping around. The team is there. They're excited. They love it. That's what happens with evangelism. But it's a rope that many of us have hung ourselves on because we don't do it. And some of us as leaders, we, we really want our people to be evangelistic, so you kind of hang them and you put the rope around their neck. That also doesn't help. You inspire, you encourage, and you expect. Everyone in the church, every single person is called to be evangelistic. Or I'm just going to be blunt with you. You're not a disciple. Okay, no, no, yes, I am. No, you're not. What's a disciple? It's a disciple of Jesus. What did Jesus come to do? Set the captives free. What are you doing? And, uh, you're not a disciple. Or maybe you repented and got baptized and became a disciple, but you stopped sharing your faith. You stopped being evangelistic. 
It's not like you have to go get baptized again, but you do need to repent. Guys, there is something special and awesome and amazing about that rope of evangelism. The more I share my faith and get into studies with people and talk to them about the, the, the gospel, talk to them about life, I just get fired up. Something happens inside because it's like, this is awesome. It strengthens your faith. It helps you understand what you have. You get even more grateful. But are you being evangelistic? And the fourth rope is generosity. The lesson I did on Wednesday night for the brothers was quiet times for life, discipleship for life, evangelism for life, and generosity for life. And uh, can we just talk as family for a minute? If you're visiting, hold on, put on your seatbelt for a second, because I'm going to talk to the family. And I hope that you still want to be family after I talk to them. Every single week, we have 40 to 50 people that don't give anything for contribution. Not a dollar, not a nickel, not a penny, not a peso, (laughs) not a yen, nothing. And they're sitting next to you. And we're going to talk family. They don't care about the Lord. They don't care about his church. They care about themselves. If they would have been the paralytic, they're like, dude, heal me. I forget the forgiveness stuff. They want something from Jesus, but don't want to give back. And it's sin. And I challenged the brothers and I laid it out. I had staff and then again Wednesday night. Starting today, if people don't want to give their contribution, I'll give them two weeks to make a decision to repent. And then if you show up again, and I hope you do, I'm going to say, listen, let's study the Bible so we can get you restored. Because something's wrong in your relationship with God. And that may hurt your feelings. Good. It's supposed to. If you're not giving to God, you, you just need to read just one chapter of anywhere in the Bible. And, I mean, there's entire books about it. First and Second Corinthians, you know what it's really about? They weren't given their contribution. Yeah. <gasps> I thought it was about love. Right, they didn't love God enough to give their contribution. Yeah. They didn't love the people or the mission enough to give their contribution. On, Paul lays it out. And there was a whole bunch of other sin in the church, and it's sin. Like, oh, Matt just wants more money. I don't need your money. Come on, I don't need it. Now, I gladly take it, and it helps pay my bills. <laughs> but I don't need it. And if it would mean you're going to give to God, if I could step out of the way, then that's what I'll do. But I don't think that's the issue. I think some people have accepted that they're just not going to be generous and they still want to have a relationship with God. And as the leader, I'm calling you out today. You got two weeks to repent. Now, someone's going to talk to me that I could have said that differently. And I probably could, but I'm not going to. I'm going to find different ways to speak about things like this. I'm going to keep learning and growing, but my question is, are you? Yeah, I could have said it differently, but you didn't change. That's the real issue. So today's the day that uh, you need to hold on to the rope of generosity. The Bible says it's more blessed to yeah. than to receive. So why aren't you giving? <laughs> Did you guys read my notes? <laughs> we got to come in for a landing here because I've been speaking for way too long. I have two more points, but I don't think I can get to them. But I just want you to ask, what would happen if we would have taken away one of the ropes that lowered Albertini down? What would happen if we would have taken away two of the ropes? What would happen if we would have had one little rope? You know what would happen? We would have hung him. But a lot of disciples live with one rope. And it's just kind of wrapping around your neck. 
I give my contribution every week, but you're not evangelistic. You don't get discipled. You don't have your quiet times. You're drifting away from God. You're starting to believe false doctrine. You don't have power in your life because you don't have the word of God in there. You don't have prayer times to really change you. You're hanging by a thread. Others are super evangelistic, but they're not getting discipled and they're in sin up to their ears. They're lying. You know, recently we had some individuals that we found out were lying for two years. And we love them to death. It was terrible. Super evangelistic. But they hung themselves because they weren't really getting discipled because they weren't being honest. Still love them. Still want them to be here with us as family. Amen. Others get discipled every single week and you're like, uh, you just want to be beaten. Like, just beat me harder, bro. Hit me. Just tell me the truth, bro. <laughs> But you haven't prayed for like six months. You get the snot beat out of you every single week. And like, I'm a Christian. No, you're hanging by a rope. Do you understand? We got to have all of these things in our lives. I really think you can boil down Christianity to these four things. Quiet times are where you learn to really love God and love other people. Discipleship is where you really learn to love God and love other people. Evangelism is where you really learn to imitate and love God and and generosity is where you really show love to God and what a victory we're going to have as the Metro Miami Church repents. As we really turn this around. Uh, maybe next week we'll get to the next two points, and that's can't live without love and titanic transformative message. We're going to talk a little bit more about Bible talks and how to build them so that they change the world, because that's what Jesus did. But today I just want to ask you, five guys on a rope show up. What do they really want? What's their biggest need? It's forgiveness. Come on, brother. Let's give our hearts today to really walk with God, to repent of anything that maybe you heard. Maybe during the singing you got convicted. Maybe during the communion you got convicted. Maybe during the contribution you realize, man, I'm far from God. And really have a heart to repent. So today, let's take heart, five guys, and a rope. Amen. Amen.